Now, ladies and gentlemen, before we call Joe Torrey to the stage, let's just take a quick peek at his storied career. A future baseball Hall of Famer has reached the top of his game as a player and manager. The kid from Brooklyn broke in as a catcher with the Milwaukee Braves of Hank Aaron and Eddie Matthews in September of 1960. Although he played some first base, he was primarily a catcher. In 1965, he won a gold glove for his excellence behind the plate. In 1969, he went to the St. Louis Cardinals in exchange for Hall of Famer Orlando Cepeda. A move from catcher to third base in 1971 didn't phase Joe. That year, he hit 363 to win the batting crown, drove in 137 runs, and won the league's most valuable player award. He retired as a player with a career 297 batting average. 252 home runs and more than 2300 hits. His managing career began while he was still playing with the Mets in 1977. He managed the Mets for five seasons, the Braves for three, and the Cardinals for six years before moving to the broadcast booth with the California Angels. In 1996 he returned to managing and his Yankees returned to the World Series for the first time in 15 years. It was his first of six American League championships. His Yankees won four World Series in five years, 1996, 98, 99, and 2000. They also made postseason play 12 consecutive seasons. Twice he earned American League Manager of the Year. He left New York following the 2007 campaign as one of the greatest Yankees, and that's saying a lot. Joe Torre's winning style is to handle the media and his players with patience and class, and that continues in Los Angeles. From day one with the Dodgers in spring training of 2008, veterans and youngsters, once divided, came together. And in his first season with the Dodgers, he went to the playoffs for the 13th consecutive season. No coincidence. Joe Torre leads by example, patiently teaching and always demanding teamwork. The t-shirts Torre had made for the Dodgers read, Players win games, teams win championships. Once the league's best catcher, once the league's batting champ and most valuable player, he is now baseball's most respected manager. Joe Torre's teams are a reflection of him. They win, and they win with class. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a nice warm welcome, Mr. Joe Torre. And he'll be joined by Ian Eagle. Hey, Ian, how are you? Good to see you. How are you? I'm fine. Great. How are you? Doing right. well. How's everybody doing? Joe Torrey. Good. Joe, your baseball travels have taken you all over the map. All over. Milwaukee, Atlanta, St. Louis, Flushing, Anaheim. Keep going. The Bronx, L.A., but you're a Brooklyn guy, no, through no, and through. No question. Of course, you, you, you talk about all those teams. You know, I've been fired three times. So, <laughs> you know, once you get fired, you go to the next city, and that's, that's what happens. I wasn't going to mention that in the resume. I was just going to go through the teams. How about coming back to Brooklyn and the emotions that, that flood back, I'm sure, for you returning to this borough? Uh, well, no question. In fact, I, I was so taken by, by the fact uh, the Nets moving here. Uh, I thought it was such a cool idea. Um, and just for game seven of the playoffs, That's right. uh, I flew in from L.A. that day, went right from the airport uh, to game seven. Of course, the, the result was disappointing, and I heard Billy talk about, do you have to bring that up? And I, I mentioned back there, well, if you win game seven, who knows, maybe you don't change coaches. So you, 
you know, it's a, everybody bemoaned the fact that the Yankees had the 2 nothing lead in the 95 playoffs, and everybody's saying we should have beaten Seattle, but I'm glad they didn't because I may not have been there in 96 <laughs> myself. It's a uh, different perspective. No, it's much different perspective, but Brooklyn is, is always, uh, you know, I grew up with the Brooklyn Dodgers and, uh, of course, the, the New York Giants and, and, and the Yankees. But uh, it was really great to be in, the, in this building that night because uh, it was electric. And there's a sense of pride for everyone that's from Brooklyn. It, look, there's a sense of pride to be from New York, to be from this area. There's something else. There's some other aspect to it when you say you're from Brooklyn. Well, there's an edge. I mean, uh, there's an edge. I mean, it, it, you know, and years ago, uh, when I used to watch television. They'd mention, Bro uh, mention Brooklyn. There would always be a giggle attached to it, you know. <laughs> right. But there was just something, some uh, mysterious thing connected with Brooklyn whether it was used as a joke or whatever, but there was always a toughness about Brooklyn. I'm, I'm not saying dangerous toughness, but I, uh, I remember going to Ebbets Field for the Dodger games, and it, it was always uh, sort of the blue-collar yeah. type of attitude, and uh, I, I think everybody pulls for the, those types of people. You just saw Jason Kidd up here. You know what he's walking into in many ways. You went through it, 1977, you're a player. Mm -hmm. You're named manager of the Mets. George Frazier was let go. You take over. Uh, you do the player-manager role, but not for long. You realize that I've got to make a decision here. As you made that transition, these are your peers. These are your teammates. And then all of a sudden, the dynamic changes. When you look back on that, what was that experience like? Uh, it was a little uncomfortable for a while, but I think Jason hit it when he said, I'm, you know, I'm just basically, I'm going to wait and see. You know, you know, if he was up here telling you exactly what he was going to do chapter and verse, then you knew that he didn't know. But the fact that he is going to make up his mind as he goes uh, and basically never forget what it was like to be a player and never forget what it was like that you respected in the coaches you played for. Uh, and, and basically in, in today's sports, um, you know, with media being such a huge part of, uh, of what goes on, and you know that players pay attention to it, but the social media, there, there's, uh, there's so many things to deal with, and, and it just comes down to finding the same message to deliver to so many different players and so many different personalities in the way they'll understand it. Uh, I have a feeling that uh, he'll get his team uh, to play hard because that's the way he, he played. Were you a natural leader growing up when, when you think back on it? You know, I used to get the uniforms for the guys and when I was a teenager and stuff. My brother Frank played baseball before I did professionally, and uh, I played for the same Sandlot team that he did. Uh, I never really uh, looked at myself as a leader, although I found myself, you know, organizing, you know, whether we played uh, slap ball or stick ball or, or baseball in the park, it was, you know, pretty much uh, I organized that. But I, I never really looked at myself as a leader, to uh, be honest with you, until I got to St. Louis. I started out in the Braves organization, uh, played there for eight years, and then was traded to St. Louis. And I think it was my second or third day, uh, year in St. Louis that I was named captain. And it sort of took me back a little bit because I didn't, you know, I'm, I'm coming to a ball club that had been in the World Series two straight years in 68 and 69. I mean, 67, 68. And uh, I felt that somebody saw something in me that I didn't know that I had. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you, you sort of take a lot in. And uh, as far as my management skills, I, uh, you know, I, as I said, I took a lot in and understood a lot and, and just tried to make sense to, at, at what I was trying to do. In talking to Jason, uh, he made the decision not to play anymore, and then a whirlwind happens. Very quickly, he gets offered this job, and it's like a wave. And all of a sudden, he's in front of the media, he's answering questions, he's doing interviews across the country, and very quickly, he's got to come up with a philosophy on how to handle things. And as you mentioned, it, it's going to take some time. It doesn't happen overnight. For you, 1977, did you have any 
idea that that's the direction that your life was going to go in. You were 37 years old, you still could have played a couple of more years, and then this opportunity pops up and everything changes. You know, I, I think my years in St. Louis, uh, playing with players who had been involved in some championships and playing for a manager like Red Shandings, I had a sense that this is what I wanted to do. Uh, of course, Bob Gibson, the Hall of Famer, used to get me in trouble because he'd say, go tell Red this and go tell Red that. And I realized I was his conduit for <laughs> his ideas. Interesting. You know, and yeah. then stuff didn't work, and then Red would look for me. You know, what the hell did you tell me that for? But, um, Red seemed like such an understanding he, guy, he, though. He, but again, he, he, was, he probably was the manager I learned the most from because he was a, he was a good player, and, and yet he let the players play. The game was about the players. The game wasn't about him. And, and I really respected that, and I learned a lot in, in that regard. But when... I was traded to, uh, to the Mets, and I played 75, uh, 76, and then actually in 76, it was interesting because there was a deal that was pending where my general manager at the time, his name was Joe McDonald, came up to me and says, how would you like to go play for the Yankees? And I said to him, uh, I've never been to a World Series, I said, but if I have a chance to manage here at some point, I said, I'd like to be considered. And I remember he put me in touch with M. Donald Grant, who was the chairman of the board, and I had mentioned that to him, and the deal never went through. Now, I'm not saying what I, my conversation had anything to do with uh, squelching the deal, but the following uh, May, I became manager of, of the Mets. Interesting, though. 1976, yeah, you could have been a Yankee. Yankees, we know what happens that year, and it then started to, to really build in 77, 78. It was Chris Chambliss, Mark Littell, Kansas City Royals, right. and the rest is history. But for the greater good oh. of your, for your career, it probably ended up being the better move for you. There, there's no question. I mean, I became manager, and... And you're right. I mean, the relationship with the players who you played alongside of was a little bit different. And the one thing I, I tried not to do was the fact, all right, now I'm manager, now all of a sudden I have this separation, and I'm going to tell you what to do. And I realized, and it was probably a, it was a good way for me to learn because you had the sense that since you knew these players that you were able to communicate with them and, and get the message across. Somebody has to make the decisions, and really the, the coach or manager's job is to have everybody understand that uh, you're never going to get anywhere if you're pulling in separate directions. As you look back on it, I'm, I'm sure there are so many people in this room, as their roles change within their companies, your role changed dramatically. Oftentimes, you are the same person, but how you are viewed now shifts a great deal, and maybe how the persona has changed. Did you find, as you were trying to ease into it, how others viewed you and how others saw you change the dynamic of the relationship? You know, I think it was gradual. I think some of the players that maybe didn't know me as well as the guys I hung out with, um, you know, those guys pretty much uh, just looked at a manager as this person. Of course, when I became manager, you were still in the, in the process of, uh, of being that person who could make demands. Uh, it's sort of like raising kids. You know, it used to be where well, you'd tell the kids what to do, and they'd say, why? And you'd say, because I told you to do it. You know, they still wouldn't understand why they had to do it, because they just listened to you. Right. Pretty much the same thing in sports or in baseball, as far as I was concerned. I always felt that if I wanted a player to do something, I wanted him to understand why he should do it. And again, they, they didn't necessarily uh, always buy into it, but eventually, you know, I've had players leave teams I managed and then come back later on to all of a sudden say, now I get it. And, you know, it was just something I felt was the right thing to do. You mentioned managerial jobs in Atlanta, in St. Louis, Everybody in this room has interviewed for a job. Mm -hmm. I believe you're the only one in this room who has interviewed with George Steinbrenner. What do you remember about that conversation? What were your thoughts going into it? And what did you walk away from thinking about the man known 
as the boss? Well, first off, I, I heard Billy say that he called Phil Jackson first. Okay, so Jason wasn't his first option. He just said it. And I was at the bottom of a list, trust me. Uh, there, was, there was a list when, when George was looking for a new manager in, uh, in 96, actually the end of 95. It was Sparky Anderson. It was Tony La Russa. It was Davy Johnson. And then it was me. And there was a PR or George cons uh, George's consultant, Arthur Richmond, the late Arthur mm -hmm. Richmond, who basically suggested my name to, to George. But Sparky retired. Uh, Davy Johnson managed, was managing the Orioles. He took that job. And Tony La Russa took over the club that fired me in St. Louis and obviously did very, very well. And the interesting part, when I was initially approached by the Yankees at the end of 95, they interviewed me to be general manager and offered me the job. At the time, my wife was pregnant with our daughter, and I said, um, is there any vacation time? <laughs> and working for George Steinbrenner, no, you work 13 months a year, that's it. And uh, I said, sorry, I said, thanks for considering me. Uh, I'm not sure I'd be a good general manager, but if I can be of any help down the road, let me know. And I, about 10 days later, they called to see if I'd be interested in, in managing. And, of course, George, uh, that first spring, uh, first of all, he had called me. He says, you're my guy. You know, <laughs> just like that, you're my guy. I said, great. You know, I look forward to it. And, of course, I was warned by a number of people, my brother Frank being one of them. You know, you realize how many times this guy has changed managers? Yeah, but I want to see if I can manage. You know, you, 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 when you're managing or coaching, you're judged by, by one thing. Do you win? Yeah. And, you know, I had been uh, with a number of ball clubs. I felt like I did a good job, but it, it didn't prove out by where you were. We made the playoffs one time with the Braves. At a, uh, my record was 100 games under 500 at the time. So um, I just thought I had an opportunity to find out if I could manage. And, you know, when he made the presentation, I jumped at it. You just laid it out, though. You weren't the number one choice, so your ego now comes into play. You can take it one of two ways in that situation. It can affect you and say, you know what, I don't know. I don't know if this is the right spot for me. You didn't see me the way I see myself. Or, which I assume you took the other angle, which was, all right, here's my chance. I'm going to show you why I should have been the number one choice, and I'll prove to you that, this is the perfect fit. Well, I think I, and I think I was proven to myself. I want to see if I could do this. And I know I'm not going to have the excuse, even though I've, I've always been a manager that, uh, you know, and I, I've talked to a number of managers along the way when they would complain about this or that about their organization. I've never done that, you know, based on the fact that these are the players you had to coach or manage. And... You have to make these players believe that they're capable of doing things that, you know, are, are good enough. So um, when, I, when I was offered this opportunity, I jumped at it based on the fact that, uh, I mean, it's New York, it's my hometown, the Yankees, it's George Steinbrenner. And I knew George was tough, but I knew also that he was committed to win. And, and, and that was the, the big uh, intrigue for me. But you rented the first year, didn't you? Well, yeah. yeah. That's why I asked him about buying a house. He says, just rent. I said, okay. <laughs> um, but I, again, you know, it's really weird because that first year, I was so excited to have this opportunity. I, I remember sitting in my office in spring training in 96, you know, watching David Cohn walk by my office, uh, you know, and, and Andy Pettit and, and all these pitchers that we had at that time you know, I've never had this type of pitching staff. So we'll find, of course, we lost about three games in a row in spring training. And come to find out later, George was still trying to get Showalter back, you know, at, at that point in time. But again, that was George. It, you know, if you let what he was doing affect you, you could, you know, go to the nut house. That was for sure. Because, you know, he was really, he wanted results like this. And uh, I was fortunate to have this ball club that had been to the playoffs the year before. So they sort of knew how to do it. And, you know, we, 
we, we got out in front and we pretty much stayed there for, for the rest of the year. I think there are people right now that are Yankee fans that are getting sentimental because Mariano Rivera has announced that he will retire at the end of the year. You've been around a lot of great players in your career as a player, as a manager, as a broadcaster, around baseball forever, as an executive. Tell us about Mariano, what makes the guy tick, and what are you going to remember most about him and what he's accomplished in his incredible career? Well, you know, I'll go back to 96. And, um, you know, we had spring training. We had Bob, Bob Wickman and John Wetland as our closers. And there was talk about trading Mariano, and I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about the American League. Uh, but I knew Mariano had come in the postseason against Seattle, and he was pretty impressive. Yeah. Knew he had arm surgery, and there was some talk in spring training about possibly trading him. Obviously, it didn't happen. It was one of those best deals that was never made. And that first year, I'm not sure exactly when this sort of formula kicked in, uh, but he started pitching the seventh and eighth inning, and then Wetland would pitch the ninth inning. And it made me really smart. All I had to do was manage six innings, because once he gave him the ball, he was magic. He was unbelievable. And, and as far as his his famous pitch, the cutter, that came about by mistake. He's down in the bullpen one day, and he threw the ball and started doing this. And Mel Stottlemyre, my pitching coach, says, how'd you do that? He says, I don't know. He just, and it just kept doing this, and it's still doing this. But uh, if, if you fast forward, you know, he became our closer in, in 97 and didn't do a very good job early on. I remember, <laughs> remember one of the games he came in to save a game uh, at home at the stadium we play in Oakland and it's never a good sign when your closer faces the same guy twice okay no, uh, those numbers and, don't add and, up well and it did happen that particular day and I remember you know calling him into my office I said it's yours I said you may you may age me but it's yours uh, and you, re you realize uh, how much different it is to get those last three outs yeah. as a because there's no safety net you're it and, uh, you know, obviously, you know, he became and the greatest. And, uh, you know, for a guy who's never been to postseason, talking about myself, when, when he has accomplished in the postseason, when all the lights and all the cameras are on, has been remarkable. Nobody will ever, ever approach that. First of all, no team is ever going to get to the postseason as often yep. as, as, as the Yankees have. And... Uh, He's a remarkable human being, and the big, big part of it is he's very spiritual, very comfortable in his own skin, and uh, he's, he's just a terrific role model for those other players on the team. You win that first championship. Now, obviously, you're, you're at the, the top of the mountain now. Everything that you dreamed of is happening for you. But guess what? There's another season and higher expectations, and it's a different role that you now play. And you're managing guys that are now champions, so the dynamic changes uh, with the egos and uh, with the different personalities. Did you change? Did you feel like you needed to adjust your style, or was it full steam ahead, I'm just going to keep going with the way I've done it? Or was there just a natural opening for you uh, to make those kind of adjustments that you need in those situations? Um, I don't know what I did. Uh, but I can tell you, 96, when we won, I mean, it, it was, we, we were the underdog everywhere we played. So it was, that was pretty nice. It's pretty easy to, to manage as an underdog. Um, you know, falling back two games to none, the World Series against the, uh, against the, the, the reigning champs, the Braves at the time. I remember George Steinbrenner coming into my office after game one of the World Series. We had gotten beat right before game two, actually. And he says, you know, this is a must game. I said, well, no kidding. You know, we only have seven games in the series, hopefully. <laughs> did, and did you say to him, no kidding? I said, or? no, yeah, no kidding. I said, but George, don't worry about it. I said, we, we may lose tonight because Maddox was pitching against us, and we hadn't played like in a week because we clinched early. I said, but we're going to go to Atlanta. We'll win three there and then come back and win it for you Saturday night. And I walked out of the office. But I was just kidding. And that's exactly what happened. You know, and he thought I was a genius, tore up my contract and gave me an extension. But, uh, you bought at that point, right? Yeah, no but, more renting. But after 96, 
uh, you know, 97, I had the same questions as everybody else. You know, once you do it, now you're supposed to do it. Right. And I remember calling Derek Jeter and, uh, because he did everything, you know, but sell programs that first year. And, and it got, when it was August or September, a lot of these veteran players were looking to him for leadership, which certainly is a great sign. And I called him and I talked about, you win Rookie of the Year, you're a good-looking kid, you're single, New York, uh, you know, you know what, uh, just want to make sure you don't, you know, your priorities are still in, intact. And he said, yeah, they are Mr. T. You know, at that time he called me Mr. T, now he calls me Buddy. But uh, <laughs> it's uh, the fact that he just never lost his focus and continues to this day. Hopefully uh, he can get healthy and get back. But... I, I, you know, what you do is you basically, my, my first meeting actually, uh, I in, in 96, uh, after watching so many other sports teams win and celebrating their victories all off season, uh, I said to the players, I, I don't want to win one World Series, I want to win three in a row, which is, which is a little bit of a hog as far as I was concerned because I'd never been to one. And... Uh, I just felt that in order to validate what we've done, we've got to keep doing it. And uh, luckily for me, that I had the ball club that had the great deal of character. Does Derek Jeter have the kind of temperament to be a manager one day? You know, I, I think, uh, I don't know if he'd, he'd want to be a manager. I, I really don't. And I, and I, you know, to me, I think he'd like to stay connected with baseball. Uh, I'd like to, I, th I think he'd like to get involved in an area, maybe ownership area or somewhere, uh, again, not to just go somewhere and sign autographs. I think he'd like to be of some use to an organization. I'm not sure he would have the patience to be a manager. Now, I'm sure over the course of your uh, managerial career, you, you made a couple of calls to the commissioner's office when you thought there may have been an injustice. <laughs> And then, as irony has it, you're now on the receiving end yeah. of these calls. That's uh, yeah. sometimes how life works. Are you surprised at all at the types of calls that you get now and the role that you're in, <laughs> or have you gotten to a point where you have heard it all? Well, let me say this. Before I, had, I was still managing the Dodgers, the commissioner called me. He says, I, when you're ready to retire, I have an idea for a job. I said, okay. So when I had had enough and, and I was just very fortunate to be, have the ability to just say I quit, uh, had enough, I went over and I'm executive VP of baseball operations, which means everything you like and don't like on the field, I'm responsible for, okay? Umpires are the teams I root for now, okay? All right? Me? And, you know, I get back and some, one of the umpires, one of the umpire supervisors, sent me a list of how many ejections I had in the, my career as a player and a manager. Uh, how many was it? Do you oh, I don't know, 70-something or whatever something. it was. But of course, only nine as a player, though. See, that was important. Um, but, you know, it's, it's still baseball, and, and my job is very, it's, there's a lot going on. Uh, I do decide on discipline. I have help. I mean, I have three senior VPs that work with me who do most of the heavy lifting. I make the, the, the decisions. Uh, I, was, I just came back actually last night. I came back, uh, my wife and daughter and I took a trip. My granddaughter graduated uh, from the American school, high school in Dubai, and I was the commencement speaker. And tried doing that on no sleep and, and dry mouth. But uh, So we spent Paris and... England came back last night, and my sister, my, my older sister, uh, she was trying to catch me up on baseball. Now, she's 87 years old. She's, she's catching me up on baseball, and she said, uh, yeah, well, you were away that uh, the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks had this fight, and there were a lot of suspensions. I said, Ray, who do you think had to suspend those people? She says, you? I said, yeah. She says, but you weren't here. I said, I know. I did it anyway. So these are the, yeah. th these are the things that I do now. Uh, it's, not, it's a lot of work, but it's not stressful. I did make the one commitment since I took this job because I knew when I used to get fined as a manager, 
I never had anybody to talk to. So now I've given all the managers and general managers my phone number. All right? And yes, you'd be surprised how many phone calls I get. Boy, your umpire at second base really stinks. You know, and I'll get these calls anytime. Okay? And it's, you know what's fun is sitting on the outside watching it because I was that person too at one time. You know, I try to be this reasonable person now. Yeah. I wasn't always that way. You got three senior VPs and your sister. And my sister. Yeah, so. I have two sisters. Well, you got two sisters that right. both have uh, baseball knowledge, you, I'm you, sure. You got. All right, questions from the audience for Joe Torrey. I think we have plenty of them. Our microphone's coming over here in the third row. Hi, it's Hi. an honor to hear you, oh. even as a Red Sox fan. Um, she had to throw that me? in there. <laughs> You're what? Uh, no, the mic cut I'm out. I'm a fan we, of yours. Is all that matters. Are you a Red Sox fan? I am. I managed a lot of those guys. But after you finish your question, my, I've got to tell you a Red Sox story. Uh, my question is, um, you've managed a lot of teams and you've played for a lot of teams. When you go out and about in a baseball hat, what hat do you wear? What hat do I wear? Uh -huh. uh, you know what? I pull for people now. <laughs> it's interesting. I, 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 try, I hope the managers are successful. Uh, I, don't, I don't pull for any team. You know, as I say, I pull for players, I, I, people I know. Uh, I just had this experience this past spring of managing Team USA in, in the uh, World Cup, with, with the World Baseball Classic, I mean. And it was really exciting because every one of those 28 players uh, were just devoted to winning. You know, and it, it made me feel good. But uh, I really don't... You know, I'm, I'm more comfortable going one place or another. I mean, I'll hang out at the stadium, even though I, didn't, I left there unceremoniously, but I'm very comfortable going there or, or out to L.A. Uh, but the Red Sox uh, uh, experience was, was fun. I had, I'm going down an elevator in Boston, last game of a series, and this couple gets on. Now, it's just the three of us. And the guy's looking at me, and he says... You're Joe Torrey. I said, yeah. And the elevator's going down. He says, um, we're going to beat you tonight. I said, well, I said, I hope not. I said, but if you do, you know, it's the way it is. Something else is coming. I know it. Okay. Now we're getting elevators dropping toward the lobby, and he says, you know, if I had a choice of beating the Yankees, or capturing Saddam Hussein, <laughs> I would pick beating the Yankees. And with that, the door opens, they walk out, and I'm still in there because I'm a little stunned at this point in time. But I do love Boston. I, I, I manage a number of their players, too. So. A guy that's got his priorities in order. That's, that's nice. All right, thank you for the question. Other questions? Want to try on, uh, on this side here? In the fourth row? Whoop, he just walked by. Oh, no, you didn't. Right over there. Feels like Phil Donahue's show. Go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you for being here again. Uh, I wanted to ask specifically about the role of catcher, especially with um, Joe Girardi coming in. On, on a really good day, uh, you have to manage the home plate umpire and one pitcher. On a terrible day, you may have to manage four or five guys on the mound and talk them off of ledges. And Do you think that's a position that naturally lends itself to being a manager based on all the personalities you have to manage. And how is that comparable in, in your mind, if you can add to somebody like a Jason Kidd who's a point guard, who we have to do that on the floor in the same... In that's, a that's, a great, that's a great question. It's a great question because you probably, as a catcher, have the most communication with the manager. Pitching is such a big part of baseball. I mean, it, you know, our sport is so different than others because you can't run the clock out. And I've, I've sat in that dugout and watched the other team score 13 runs, okay? Uh, you'd like to say, okay, I give, you know, but you can't do that. Uh, but I, I, it's, a, it's a great question. The catcher, yeah, I think Girardi, uh, the fact that, you know, pitching is such a big part of the game and being a psychologist, which is what you have to be as a catcher, uh, is very, very similar to, to Jason Kidd. Uh, and, you know, he's soft-spoken. 
and you know that's probably the way he was, you know, it is, it was in the huddle and, and talking to his coach. And what Mike Krzyzewski said to him, you do, do what you do. And then if there's something I have to rein in, I'll rein in. He knows that he sees the whole floor. You know, you have some, some basketball players will get the ball and they only see the basket, you know, because they know I want to get it there. Uh, as, as a, uh, a point guard and as, as you know, the guard that, uh, you know, the, the game that uh, Jason has played all these years, he sees everybody. You know, he doesn't only see the basket. He sees the basket at times, but he's basically thinking about, let's get this group playing together. I, I think there's a, a great deal of similarity with uh, the catcher and, and what Jason has done. Are you a former catcher, sir? Really? All right, interesting. Giving credit to the catchers, but <laughs> great question. Any other questions for Joe Torrey? Yes, sir. What do you think of the rumor that uh, Brett is negotiating to buy the New York Mets and make you manager? Who is Brett? Your mark. Oh, really? Is that, are you starting that rumor, sir, or is that actually out Can't there tell you. on Twitter? Can't tell okay. You. Can't making tell you. who the manager? He's making you the manager. No, apparently. no, no. I've, I've done that. I've done that. I really don't miss the managing part, and the, and the I enjoyed it for the three weeks. I did it with uh, Team USA. Oh, unfortunately, it was like two weeks. We we missed the, the finals, but. Uh, that was sort of like getting all your grandkids, you know, and having them and hugging them and tell them how good they were and then sending them back to their parents. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I, I think the biggest, um, the, the biggest issue, if it was just managing in the dugout with the players, because missing, the, the thing I miss about managing are the players and, and the challenge of having these 25 guys understand what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, but media, uh, social media, we got everybody's opinions, uh, call-in radio shows. We, I mean, we've got all this stuff that, that make it difficult. We know, I mean, you're not going to put the genie back in the bottle. It is what it is, and that's where we are. And, and it's not only baseball or sports. It's every category. And it's, it's very, very difficult. If it was just a fact of going out, putting the uniform on, uh, or maybe not putting the uniform on, but going in the dugout and managing, that's the fun part. But everything else connected with it nowadays is, is, is time, not only time-consuming, but uh, very tough to be as positive as you want to be. Any other questions? We've got one back here. Just grab the microphone. Hi, Joe. Um, Hi. So when you were the manager of the Yankees, you managed a lot of big egos and personalities. What would you say was your most effective managerial um, strategy for managing those big egos and personalities? Probably being honest with them and, and asking them on several occasions, uh, you want to sit where I'm sitting and understand the decisions I have to make. Uh, the one thing that I consistently tried to get across to them is the fact that made them accountable to each other and not to me. Uh, it's not fair if, if Bill runs hard to first base and you don't have to. I mean, that's not fair. And, and I, we need everybody to pull together. At some time during the course of the season, you have 25 guys and each and every one of them are going to be put in a position where they're going to help you win a game. It's, it's going to happen. And you just, uh, you basically try to sell that to the players. And I had <laughs> a player, uh, Ruben Sierra, my first year. Sure. And Ruben was playing the outfield for me, and we're, we're in Seattle this, this one game. And I, and I don't pay a lot of attention to stats, because I, I never want to forget that there are blood running through these guys' veins and the heartbeat that you feel that you have a sense of what you want to do. Unless something, a stat jumps out at me that I can't ignore. Well, there was this one stat that he didn't hit this particular pitcher very well. And I, I said, Ruben, I, and I always delivered the bad news, being the manager. I would never tell a coach or I'd never post a lineup if somebody was a regular player unless I called him in and told him why I was doing this. So I called him in and I said, Ruben, you're not going to play today. You're going to play tomorrow, but you don't handle this pitcher very well and whoever I was putting in the outfield... He hits him better. He said, okay, but why am I not playing? 
I said, well, let me, let me try this again. I said, and I did the whole thing. I said, no, you, you're fine. You're still the regular outfielder. I said, but today you're not playing because you, this pitcher gets you out all the time. Okay, but why am I not playing? I said, well, I realized he didn't want to get it. It wasn't that he didn't get it. So we traded him. We, we traded him for, for <laughs> we, we traded him for Cecil Fielder uh, in in '96, and he went over to Detroit. And I knew it was going to happen. Detroit comes to town. He hits a double to beat us a ball game. Now the writers, as you may guess, run over to his locker and they want to interview him and tell him, you know, see if he has something nasty to say about the Yankees, and he did. He says, I like it better over here because all those guys want to do over there is win. So that was the quote. And so if I'm going to be criticized, that's all right. If I'm going to be criticized, all I want to do is win. So the coach, the manager, uh, Phil Garner at the time, says he's going to find out that we want to win too. Uh, but Reuben made his way back to us. And uh, he had come over in one spring and apologized for, you know, not necessarily getting it and all this stuff, and came back and, and became a good leader, especially of the Latin players. But uh, it, it's just, uh, it, it's, it's a challenge. You know, it's sort of like, uh, and I don't know if the, the guys uh, can relate to this, but when I was growing up, you, had, you always played baseball. You were the manager, and you put these guys in. You'd roll the dice or spin the dial, whatever it was, and now you're doing it with real people. And it, it's pretty cool. It's, it's really exciting to do that. The days of Stratomatic. Trying to, exactly, trying to be creative. On your right hand, uh, you've got a, a ring there. It's yep. kind of shiny. Uh, how do you make the choice? Which one to wear on a daily basis? Uh, first one, 96. And I remember I'd stop wearing it. Uh, and my wife says, where's your World Series ring? I said, well, I... You know, I think my nose attracts enough attention. I don't need to wear this <laughs> ring. And she said, uh, you waited all these years, and that's all you complained about is you never had it. Uh, so I started wearing it again. And it's, um, it's certainly something I'm proud of. In fact, after we won in 96, she said, well, now that you did this, let's go, you know, retire and go start a flower farm in Hawaii. And I said, let's see if we can do it again. Yeah. And so. uh, for you, uh, I know your charity, uh, Joe Torrey Foundation, has been a, a big part of your life. Just tell us a little bit about what's going on with that. And it's something that's lived on and on even after you left New York and went out to the West Coast. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, we have our Joe Torrey Safe at Home Foundation. Uh, I grew up in a household my dad abused my mom. And, and I, um, I had certain feelings growing up uh, of inadequacy, basically. I'm, I'm the youngest of five children. My older siblings used to whisper and stuff. And, and I, when they were whispering, I thought I did something wrong, but I realized that they were just trying to protect me from what was going on in the house. My dad was a cop, and he used to, you know, beat up on my mom and uh, threaten her with a gun and the whole thing. And I, and I had... I guess I had these feelings that were connected, and I didn't know until years later when I went through therapy. In fact, my wife was pregnant. I'll give you in the middle 90s, actually, before I came to New York. Uh, she said, you want to go to this self-help uh, conference with me? I said, sure. Well, she was pregnant. I'm going to say yes to anything she asked me. <laughs> so we went over there, and I found myself standing in front of perfect strangers, crying my eyes out, and uh, realizing that some of the feelings I had, because I... I I played baseball as a pretty good player, uh, but I always felt that I had to perform. I had to get base hits to, to feel, to validate who I was and, and to be useful to anybody. And it, I didn't realize until that particular symposium that uh, I was, the reason I had some of these insecure feelings and fears and nervousness uh, was connected with what went on in my life as a kid. And... Um, so when we got to New York, we always did something in relation to kids. And when Allie asked me uh, what charity, I said, how about domestic violence? And sort of caught her off guard because she's one of 16 children and uh, that stuff didn't go on in her house. 
And it was her idea to, to do it through education. So what we do, uh, we raise money and, and uh, we put safe rooms in schools with a master's level counselor to have these kids. Because I never told anybody. I have friends I grew up with never knew what was going on in my house. And uh, so we have uh, these safe rooms we call, we name after my mom, Margaret's Place. And it's a, a room for these kids to go in and understand it's not their fault and they're not to blame and, and they're not alone. Uh, so it's, it's, it's worked really well. We've, we've been 10 years now. We've had thousands of kids come through our program. And, and it's, uh, we have eight schools here in New York, plus we work with the mayor and the Brooklyn and Queens Family Justice Center where we have a Margaret's Place in each one of those, and then we have two in L.A. So we're, we're, uh, we're very, you know, satisfied uh, with the results of what we're our program, but, you know, we just need to reach more kids. Joe, continued success. Thank you. A true ambassador of the game, Joe Torrey, and a class act on a personal level. I met Joe when I was nine years old. He was the manager of the Mets, 1978. You could not have been any nicer to a nine-year-old kid, and all these years later, you're the same guy. With all the success, we wish you all the best. That means a lot. Thanks, right. Joe Torrey.